I'm so excited to be here to talk about one of my favorite saints. So tonight, though, I'm not going to talk at you. I really invite you to enter into an experience tonight. Um, St. Charbel is a powerful, powerful intercessor. And the reason that St. Charbel is such a powerful intercessor is because his life was lived completely conformed to Jesus. He had a great devotion to the Blessed Mother. We'll talk about all that tonight. But that's why we love St. Charbel. We want to imitate him in growing closer in relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me just go through. We're going to do an introduction. We'll talk about who St. Charbel is, the personal relationship with Jesus, and how we want to grow deeper in that. And then I want to share with you the chaplet of St. Charbel. It's a great devotion. We'll go through the, the, the virtues of the chaplet, and then we're going to have some fun talking about the miracles. There's about three miracles that I want to share with you. And then at the end, I open it up for anybody here that's had an experience. Maybe St. Charbel has touched your life in one way or another. We would love to hear your testimony of, of healing or experience, okay? Just a brief introduction. I was raised in a Lebanese Maronite Catholic home. My mom is Lebanese, my father's Croatian, and through the influence of the Maronite Catholic, my, my mom, my grandmother, we knew Saint Charbel from the time I was a little girl. He was always part of our family. And so I'm gonna share with you the first miracle that I ever experienced, and that'll set the stage for where this talk comes from. So my grandfather, we grew up in Pittsburgh. My grandfather had migraine headaches, severe migraine headaches, to the point for like 20, 30 years. The headaches were so bad, I remember sometimes he would take his head and bang his head against the wall. Well, one day, my grandmother had a great devotion to St. Charbel. Her best friend actually is related to St. Charbel, to the Mahlou family that I'll tell you about in a minute. But my grandfather grabbed a relic that was around there was pictures and relics and all kinds of stuff in our house. That it was loaded. It was like, a, like you were walking into church, right? And he grabbed it, and I remember he put it on his head, and he, he yelled out to God, saying, God, please help me. St. Charbel, help the pain. I vividly remember that, and that was it. He never had a headache again. That's the starting point. So I don't have notes. We're going to talk. We're going to open up and, and really... I hope that if you don't know who St. Charbel is tonight, you're in the right place. Because he's a saint that wants to introduce himself to people that don't know him. And, and you'll get that as we go through the talk. Who is this St. Charbel? Well, he was born in 1828, died in 1898. He was 70 years old. And he was a, a hermit, a monk, and a priest. He was born by the name of Joseph. His name was Joseph Mahlouf. When he was three years old, his father died. And he was raised in a very devout Maronite Catholic home by his mother. He was the youngest of five children. He had two uncles that were in the monastery, but as he was growing, he, became, he was very devout, and, and they knew from early on that there was something different about this little boy. If you go to, to the village where he was born in Bakafra, up in the mountain, higher in the northern of Lebanon, there's a small cave still there where as a boy he would go in, he would pray, he'd bring a little statue of the Blessed Mother, and he, he grew in his devotion to God as a little boy. The kids would make fun of him, you know, that whole thing. But as he grew, he, he knew that he wanted to enter the monastery. At the age of 23, he, he left home, he set out for the monastery and didn't turn back. He never looked back. If you see the movie, there's a, a, a St. Charbel movie that's out. There's one scene where his mother tries to come and see him. And he doesn't allow his eyes to see his mother again. And people say, well, isn't that rude? Isn't that awful? But if you know the, the, the monastic rule, number one, the rule of obedience, women were not allowed in. But more than that, it was a sacrifice for him not to allow himself to see his mom because his life was a sacrifice. He chose to sacrifice his entire life for Jesus. So in the monastery, he began growing and miracles began happening. Even as a monk, many, many miracles would happen. For example, um, there's a story where the superior his family member was, was dying, and they asked Father Charbel to come 
and pray at the bedside. And he prayed, he did that, and she was healed. So they knew that, that there was something different about this, this monk. And he always aspired to join the hermitage. He wanted to be a hermit, but for whatever reason, for years, they, he wasn't allowed to enter the hermit for whatever reason from the superior. But I wanna share with you the miracle of the lamp story because that was the turning point that, that was a, a miracle that happened that gave the superior insight in allowing him to become a hermit, to enter the hermitage. So one day, Father Sharba was there, the, the superior asked him to review some records and stay up later in the evening. They had the oil lamp. And if you know anything about the monastery back in the 1800s, right, there were no lights, they, they used lamps. And so he went to one of the brother monks and he said, you know, he needed oil to be filled. Well, they, they played a joke on him. They filled it with water. And when he went to light the lamp, it lit, and it, it, it lit on water. And so obviously they, the joke was on them, right? And they went to the superior and... He tasted it and lo and behold, he realized that, that this is a supernatural, this is a miraculous sign from God. And the next, with, within that next year or even sooner than that, he was entered into the hermitage. Now, Father Charbel died Christmas Eve. Advent is a very special time for, for St. Charbel. We're in Advent now and when he, when he died, he died Christmas Eve, but he collapsed eight days before Christmas Eve. This is a, a man who lived his life in complete prayer. He would wake up in the middle, wee early hours of the night in front of the Eucharist in preparation for Mass. He would spend hours just in preparation and adoration to celebrate the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And then after Mass, he would spend hours giving thanks to God for the gift of his son. It sustained him. He realized he knew what and who was in the host, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And he acted accordingly. So tonight, as we go through the chaplet, one of the intentions and one of the prayers that, that we wanna ask is through the intercession of St. Charbel is to have a greater devotion for Jesus in the Eucharist and a greater devotion to our Blessed Mother. So, on Christmas Eve, there's a prayer. He was celebrating the Divine Liturgy and there's a prayer called the Father of Truth Prayer. It's a prayer to the Father offering the sacrifice of the Son. He collapsed during that part of the Divine Liturgy. And then for eight days, he continued praying those words. That prayer is part of the chaplet of St. Charbel. Now I want you to understand how powerful this saint is. 30 plus 30,000 miracles have happened through the intercession of this saint. God hears his prayers. When, when we ask St. Charbel to intercede for us, nobody goes away with a prayer unanswered. You may not get the answer that you ask for, but God hears his prayers. And tonight, we're here for a reason. This isn't just a, a lecture. This is a time tonight that God is present through the intercession of St. Charbel. I'm gonna tell, tell you about this, this relic here in a minute that let's expect tonight that God is gonna show up answering the prayers, the petitions that we come with, especially during this holy season of Advent. Remember, it was that time that St. Charbel spent his last eight days life on earth, praying, connecting to God. What's amazing is that if you read about St. Charbel, you read that he had a stroke. You know, they said that you know, he had a stroke, he collapsed, and then eight days, he died. Well, when, when we were in Lebanon in 2018, we had an opportunity to talk to the monks and, and so forth, and the story that we got directly from the monk, because I wanted to get as much information as I could, because I asked him about the Father of Truth prayer and the chaplet and the devotion. He said, you know, St. Charbel was not sick. He was a worker horse. He worked in the fields. He was 70 years old. He was healthy. He wasn't sick a day in his life. I think one time he had kidney stones or something like that. But other than that, the man was 
con connected to God, and that's all he did was pray and work, and when he worked, he was praying. So what they believe happened was that he was so engrossed in the, the, the moment that, that they, he believes that he experienced God's face. And when we see God's face, you can't, you, you can't survive it. And that's what they believed happened, that it was so powerful that that's what happened. Now, when he died, there was a chapel where they placed his body in the hermitage. That night, there was a monk there that there was an eyewitness that a light shone from the tabernacle directly upon St. Charles' face. Immediately, they knew that he was a saint. He was buried very humbly, like any other hum hermit, in a wooden box. Within a couple days, there was a, a, sh a shining light that began to emanate from the grave. And people from the surrounding villages started to come. On the spot, people were healed. So 45 days went on. This is in 1898 now. There was so much happening that they had to exhume his body. And when they did, his body was completely incorrupt, warm, pliable, sweating, sweating to the point where there was a body fluids mixed with blood, where they had to move him four different times because the, the fluids in the body just kept, kept leaking out, literally through the wall. Now, what I didn't tell you is that, well, my grandmother's best friend, who happens to be, we call her Aunt Sadie, is my mother's godmother. She was a mahluf. And she was related to St. Charbel's family. So Aunt Sadie's great-great-great-grandfather and St. Charbel's father were brothers. That's how close the relationship was. So when that happened, the family had to change his clothes because, it, I mean, it was constant. And so the Mahlou family, the, the grandfather, Saint Sh Aunt Sadie's grandfather was in Lebanon, and what they did was they would change his clothes and they would take pieces of the cloth and they would make into little relics and they would send them to family members and people and people were being healed constantly. That's what we have here. My grandmother got that and Father Charlie can verify to this is a family, I call it, a, uh, it's never left my house. Let me just tell you that. But uh, we were talking about it, he said, yeah, why don't you bring it? What happens is, they take the piece of the cloth that has the sweat and the blood from the saint, and the nuns at the time would crochet a little casing. And that's what's in the reliquary here. So you'll have an opportunity to venerate that later, later tonight. So St. Charbel was canonized in 1977. This is what Pope Paul VI said the day that St. Charbel was canonized. St. Charbel's life was a quest for sanctity and his life is the most perfect conformity to the humble and poor Christ. That's who St. Charbel is. Nobody knew who he was when he lived. Now, he's known all over the world. This is just a picture. Early on, Aunt Sadie would give us a lot of literature. This is the prayer for St. Charbel to become beatified uh, for Father Charbel. So, we're not talking about somebody that is distant off. This is somebody that is like part of the family. And not just my family, he wants to get, he wants to know you. He wants to introduce himself to you, get to know you, and help you develop a closer relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the whole purpose of St. Charbel. Now I want to show you a video. This is the original home of St. Charbel in the village called Bakafra, where he grew up as a little boy. Entering the house, this is one of the original rooms where he grew up. This is the Valley of the Saints, also known as the Holy Valley. In this valley, we find the monastic heritage of Lebanon. In the monastery of Marlisha, we find the typical setting of a cave, a chapel, the stairs, the rock wall that gives you the feeling that you've left this world and entered into the tomb of Jesus. The cave setting is a reminder 
that we are pilgrims and that our eyes are fixed constantly on heaven. The monastery of St. Charbot in Anaya, Lebanon. His body currently is in this place. Many, many miracles continue to occur here. This is a very sacred space in front of his tomb. This is the outside wall of the monastery. Entering inside, we see the chapel where daily mass is celebrated. Took a picture of the monks outside, lined up against the wall of the monastery. When they developed it, a sixth monk appeared. It was Saint Charbel. And it's the picture that everyone uses for his portrait, for his icon. This is the area where St. Charbel toiled and worked in the field. He lived out the rest of his life in this hermitage. This is where he was laid to rest in this chapel. The cell of St. Charbel. We see that he slept on the floor using a tree trunk as a pillow. We cannot say that Saint Charles is just for the Maronite Church or just for the Catholic Church. Saint Charles is the saint today for all the world, for all the religions. Because he is near God, he can put us near God. The chaplet of Saint Charles is a great place to start if you're interested in developing a devotion to this great saint. But it's, it's simply a small set of beads, and the chaplet is comprised of a medal, and on the medal is where you pray the Father of Truth prayer. Those are the words that St. Charbel continued to repeat. There's, three, there's five sets of three beads where you say one Our Father, three Hail Marys, in honor of St. Charbel's fidelity to the vow of poverty, chastity, obedience, love for the Eucharist, and love for Mary. And then there's the prayer to obtain graces that we're gonna pray in a little bit. It's a card that everybody's welcome to tonight. That's the prayer that when you hear people talk, or I know Father Chris Aylard did a talk, and you know, he, he brought it up and he said, this is the prayer, now is the time. If you want to implore and excuse me, ask God to answer your prayer through the intercession of St. Charbel, now is the time to do it. We're gonna do that tonight. Okay, let's just go through each of them. The first one is poverty. What do we mean by poverty? Well, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It, it's humility. So in the chaplet, every time you pray the chaplet, we ask God to give us holy humility. We know that humility is the anecdote to pride. Pride is one of the deadly sins, right? And so we ask God to help us to grow in humility. St. Charbel was the perfect example of what it meant to be humble. The next one is chastity. Jesus said, blessed are the pure of heart for they shall see God. In other words, let us keep our eyes focused on God, to be single-hearted, right? To not be pulled in every direction, to not you know, have this way and that way, but to be single-hearted, our eyes fixed on God. That's what we, we ask God for, holy chastity. Next is obedience. This is the prototype of who St. Charbel was. He was obedient. When you hear people talk about St. Charbel, you can't talk about him without mentioning that he was obedient. Obedient to God, first of all, obedient to the rule, the monastic rule, that was his life. And so we're called to do the same. The next one is love for the Eucharist. Now I wanna get into really the purpose of the chaplet, because the power in praying the chaplet is to come closer to Jesus in the Eucharist and to come closer to the Blessed Mother. And so, you know, St. Charbel knew exactly who was in the Eucharist. 
that it's the flesh, it's the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. His body showed that, his posture showed that. And so Jesus says to us, you know, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That's why we're here as Catholics. This is the reason that we are here. And if you recall in scripture, you know, in Jesus' day when they thought, oh, this is a symbol, and you know, even some of the disciples turned away. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't handle that. What did Jesus do? He doubled down. You know, this is not symbolic. St. Charbel's life was committed to that, to Jesus present in the Eucharist. And so one of the challenges that I have that tonight, just to keep in mind as a posture, that when we receive the Eucharist, to not only let everybody else around know, to you know, prove it to ourselves, but to show God that we know who he is. You know, not to walk down the aisle like this, or you know what I mean? There's a reverence there, there's a sacredness there. And let's ask St. Charbel to help us to, to be more sacred in receiving the Eucharist. And when we do that, we open, it's like unlocking the lock that allows God's grace to come in and do what he wants to do in our life. So the Eucharist was really who St. Charbel and what he was all about. And finally, the Blessed Mother. Again, this is who we are as, as Catholics, as Christians that love for Mary, St. Charbel knew who the Blessed Mother was. You know, she wasn't just another person. She was created by God in a special way because God was gonna use her to have his son come in the flesh. Now think about it for a moment. Wouldn't you want to have the most perfect vessel? No sin, not even a hint of sin. It, it's impossible. That's who St. Charbel knew innately who Mary was. And I wanna, I wanna answer a question that a lot of people ask. Where in the Bible does it say that Mary is the Immaculate Conception? In Luke 1.28, the angel came to Mary. The angel knew who Mary was because if you look at the greeting, the angel said, hail, full of grace. The Greek word is gere kekeretomene. It's a six-syllable six word, kekeretomene. It's a word, if you've never heard it before, I invite you to Google it, read about it. Because it's a word that's never been used ever in Greek literature. It's never been a title for anybody other than the Blessed Mother. And what it means is that you who've always been filled with grace and continue to be filled with grace, that's who you are. That's who the angel came and greeted. St. Charbel, all of the saints knew who Mary was, and we're called to do the same. Just knowing those two things, the, the devotion to the Eucharist and to our Blessed Mother, because that's what St. Charbel wants us to do. He doesn't want to be placed on a pedestal, right? He's a humble hermit. He lived his life in seclusion. Everything he did reflected Jesus and the relationship that we are developing with Jesus Christ, okay? This is my favorite part. There's three miracles that I wanna share with you. Now, if you look it up, if you Google right now, St. Charbel miracles, you'll see over 30,000 miracles documented, verified to date. So there's only three that I'm gonna share with you. The first one is a lady from Lebanon. I'll tell you a little bit about her. Her name is Nuhad El Shami. She was 55 years old in 1993 when she had a stroke. She had a massive, massive stroke. Bilateral carotid arteries were blocked. She was completely paralyzed. And when you have bilateral blockages, there's nothing that anybody could do. Too high of a risk for surgery. She was a vegetable, there was nothing to do. So she had her son go to Anaya to get the holy oil and to get some of the dirt, the, holy, the, the sacred soil, and brought it home that night, she blessed herself with the oil, she prayed, asking Saint Charbel to heal her. That's all she did. She believed, she had faith that nothing is impossible for God, 
and she went to sleep. That night, she, St. Charbo appeared to her. Two monks appeared to her. One monk was at the bed, the head of the bed with the pillow, as she describes it, and the other monk did surgery on her. Yeah, that's what I said, did surgery on her. She woke up with two scars. Now, if you look at the picture, you can see there's a scar on her neck. And, you know, this isn't just a little story. She's there with Pope St. John Paul, the two. So this is huge. She was completely healed. St. Charbo appeared to her a couple days later and said, you know, um, I am who did the surgery and, you know, come to the, the monastery on the 22nd of every month to propagate the faith and, you know, go to Mass daily. And that's what she's done. Since 1993, the 22nd of every month, they've been having these healing, prayer, Eucharistic processions in Lebanon where St. Charbel's Monastery is. I'll show you a picture of what it looks like. Thousands and thousands of people come. But not only that, there are like hundreds of healings that happen just that day. So when we went to Lebanon, obviously we made the, the arrangements to be there over the 22nd. Every time you go, you want to be there for the 22nd because it's, it's a powerful encounter with Jesus Christ in his healing power. In fact, um, I don't think I shared this before, but when I was there, I, I wandered around. There's a TV studio that's built just to be able to capture the testimonies of all the people that want to give their testimonies of the healings that happen. So it's time stamped. If you look closely, there's somebody with a mask. So this isn't like years ago. This is like last month. It takes faith. And that's all that's, near, that's all that's needed. Your faith can, will heal you. So that's what this is about. Beautiful miracle. That's the first one that I wanted to share. The second one is right here in Phoenix, Arizona, was a huge miracle. Now people know about it all over the world. 2016, I'm not gonna talk about it because I have a little clip of Daphne telling you the story, but just briefly, the relics of St. Charbel came, and so she was completely blind when she came into the church, and she was completely healed. So let me just let you listen to the little video that I put together just for you tonight. I edited it, and nobody's ever seen this clip it, so we'll let you see it. Hello, my name's Daphne. I was blind from my right eye. I lost my vision from my left eye, and the doctor, at the hospital told me that, that there was no way that I was going to get my vision back. I went to St. Joseph Maronite Catholic Church to visit the relics of St. Charbel. We get there for the healing mass, you know, to, to touch the relics. But when we, when we got there to the, to the church, it was one of those times where, where you were just like tired and you say, please, God, help me. You know, I'm tired. I'm going to give in to you. Please hear me out. If you don't want to do it for me, do it for my kids. It was 4 o'clock in the morning. I felt my eyes burning. Did a thorough exam. Interestingly, her vision didn't come back on that first exam. Within 48 hours, when she went to a second <coughs> ophthalmologist, her exam was completely, completely normal. They, they did the test and I couldn't see clearly. My 48 hour, I had 20-20 vision. We as a medical uh, committee in reviewing this case cannot explain this medically. Like the doctors said, there is no explanation. God healed me. That's powerful. It changed my life. I mean, it really, it really did. Um, to see somebody whose vision was completely obliterated. I have a picture of the optic disc. When you, when you look in the, like an ophthalmoscope, you have a, they did a picture. Within 48 hours, it was completely normal. I mean, you just don't see that. Now you may say, okay, well, you're a believer, right? You know. Uh, you're Lebanese, you're Maronite, you're, you know, you believe, even your mom's, you know, godmother is related, you know. Well, when Daphne called the church, 
Father Wassam contacted me and I said, well, the first thing I'm gonna do is try to disprove it, number one. The second thing is I'm not gonna do this alone. We put a group of over 25 physicians, there was a whole group of physicians that scrutinized the medical records. Then we took her to three other specialists. Absolutely no medical explanation whatsoever. Through the power of St. Charbel, God is who healed her, like Daphne said, but it's through St. Charbel's prayers. You see, when St. Charbel was alive, his life was committed to Jesus. He sacrificed so much that we say he was so passionately in love with Jesus when he was alive that now, whatever he asks Jesus, he won't refuse him. Do, do, do you get that? Do you understand kind of that, that mentality? That's who we're dealing with here. Let's go to the, to the last miracle. Now, not too many people know about this because this is a personal experience that I had um, with a baby. I'll, I'll just give you a, this is a baby. Um, a friend of mine's daughter had a baby. Her name is Lena. The baby was born with an umbilical cord wrapped around her neck. And when she was born, the vocal cords were paralyzed and she couldn't swallow. Immediately she was aspirating, meaning that anything that they would give her would go into the lung and the baby went into immediate respiratory distress, had to be life lighted to Children's Hospital. This is in my hometown in Pittsburgh where I grew up. This is one of my childhood friend's daughter who had this baby. Well, interestingly, we were flying from Phoenix back to Pittsburgh because my parents spend the, the summers in Pittsburgh just like a couple days after the baby was born. But when I heard about it, it affected me unbelievably. I can't, even till this day, I can't explain to you why this child's illness affected me. But for whatever reason, God, I think, had prepared me or made me or whatever to, to pray for this baby. And I did, and I said, you know what? I have oil from, that we brought back from St. Charbel's tomb. I'm gonna bring it and I wanna go to the bedside of the baby and pray and bless her with the oil. So I did exactly that. Now, I gotta tell you, I'm not one that blesses people. I mean, I'm not, I'm not consecrated. I don't feel that I can even do that. Usually we give the oil and, and you do it. But the baby was, you know, a little teeny baby and I had the oil on a Q-tip and I walked into the, to the hospital room, I'll never forget it, the chaplet was hanging on the bedside, along with the rosary, and, um, and they knew exactly why I was there. And, uh, and I said, you know, you know, Jenna was the mom's name, I said, you know, I brought oil back from St. Charbel. I said, I, you know, I just feel like we, we wanna say a prayer and let's bless the baby. I started praying the Lord's Prayer and I took the Q-tip and I made the sign of the cross on the baby's forehead. Immediately, the baby choked like three times like a strider ch choke, and it, it scared me. And it was like, I said, you know, is the baby okay? And Jenna's like, oh yeah, you know, it's okay. So a few minutes later, I left. Well, let's go to the next, the next slide. Three, that was Friday night. Three days later, the baby was being discharged to home. So she called me for Sunday, and she said, you know, they told me that they took the tube out, the baby did great ever since. And this is the text. She said, Ann, I want to thank you again for stopping by last night and bringing the holy oil with you. It meant so much to have you pray over Lena, and I honestly feel such a comfort. Thank you for keeping her in your prayers. And then that was on the 12th. So then, three days later, Lena is going home today. Truly, I believe in my heart that because of the prayers, the St. Charbel, you know, since that day, put the oil on her head, she's been progressing. Words will never express our gratitude. And so then if you look at the next picture, this is, I said to her, I said, Jenna, do you remember the baby coughing three times? And so she sent me a, a yeah, I, you know, Lena's doing really great, still eating, thank you for asking. And then she goes on, I do remember her having three Strider coughs. It's amazing, such a miracle. Me and my mom talk about it daily. And then if you look at the next picture, this is the baby. So, you know, it's just one of those little glimpses that through the intercession of St. Charbel. Now, you know, that's the power that prayer does. That's the access that we all have tonight, is through the intercession of St. Charbel, God answers our prayers. All right, we're wrapping it up now. So now I want to 
get us into a posture of prayer. Everything he did directed us toward Jesus and the relationship with Jesus. So now let us pray this prayer together. What is it exactly right now tonight during Advent, during the season where St. Charbot was a very powerful time for him during Advent in connection with God? Let's ask him to answer our prayers tonight. And before we begin, let's just give God permission to enter in. Let's open up our hearts, allow the Holy Spirit to come. For there's nothing is impossible for him. To raise our prayers, our heart, our thoughts, everything up like incense being raised up to heaven. So let's pray together. Open your eyes. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We'll pray out loud together. Lord, infinitely holy and glorified in your saints, you have inspired Charbel, the saint monk, to lead the perfect life of a hermit. We thank you for granting him the blessing and the strength to detach himself from the world so that the monastic virtues, poverty, chastity, and obedience may triumph in his hermitage. We beseech you to grant us the grace of loving and serving you, following his example. Almighty God, who manifested the power of St. Charbel's intercession through his countless miracles and favors, grant us this favor. which we request through his intercession. In Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.